So as the title suggests, I'm going to talk about validity and reliability of this system um, tensiomyography. Um, just to recall a little bit these definitions. Now, validity, as you probably know, uh, is um, <coughs> the extent to which uh, an instrument, a device, a test, measures what is supposed to measure. Um, now, when we look at tensiomyography, now, a way to measure validity of this um, system, well, is trying to answer this question, really. So is TMG measuring mechanical contractile properties of skeletal muscle as the, you know, our friend claimed that he is actually doing? Uh, now, the way to, to proceed is um, looking at construct validity. So we can't really uh, look at um, criterion validity or concurrent validity. It's a matter of construct validity, which means that we need to find a number of indicators to prove the construct, which is you know, the question that I started with. <clears throat> OK, so I'm going to uh, show very quickly uh, three studies, actually four studies, looking at uh, validity of tensiomyography. Now, the first one is, is very old, published in uh, 1997. Uh, it's probably the first study, would you say it's the very first study uh, published? Um, very, very simple research design. You see only one subject. I would say, if you don't mind me saying so, it's actually quite a weak research design, but it, it dates back to 20 years. So on, only one subject, uh, for a number of muscles, lower limb muscle, muscles measured. Uh, what they... What they did was measuring, uh, so you now re can recognize the curve there, so displacement time curve, and they extracted those variables that um, Sergey mentioned before. Um, now, using the displacement and contract time, they actually um, worked out the velocity of the muscle contraction, and they made an assumption, uh, very kind of broad assumption, if, if you wish. So um, you know those fi four, five muscles there? So the assumption was that the soleus, as we know, has a prevalence of uh, uh, slow twitch fibers, whereas quadriceps and brachioradialis, uh, they have a prevalence of fast twitch fibers. So they, what, what they did was looking at the velocity of contraction of those muscles. And they basically associated a higher velocity with those muscles which we know from the literature have a prevalence of uh, fast twitch fibers. Oh, sorry. And um, whereas those muscles with the prevalence of slow twitch fibers had, a, had a, a, like a lower contraction velocity. Now, the next study I'm showing you has been published uh, some 10 years later. Uh, it's a slightly more robust research design, not, not perfect though, as, as it will see in, in a second. Uh, much larger sample size, so they, they recruited uh, 30, as you can see, 30 healthy males and 30 male sprinters. Similar age, they were matched for age and physical characteristics, and the sprinters were quite fast, I would say. Uh, PB in 100 meters was 10.5 seconds. And they also um, had samples from, um, well, that, that's correct, it's not, it's not a, a, an error there. So they had male cadavers that they used to take some, some bioptic samples of their muscles. Um, and they measured in a, in biceps femoris and a number of other muscles. Now, uh, there, are, there are pretty much two studies within that publication. Uh, so in the first one, they compared contraction time between healthy males and sprinters, and they found you know, that contraction time was slower for healthy males compared to, sprinter, to sprinters, and, uh, <coughs> and they found a, 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 a negative relationship between um, contraction time and running speed in sprinters. So, so that's great. They basically pretty much show that, uh, you know, that the, the, the device is sensitive enough to, to show a difference between healthy individuals and, and sprinters. Now, what they did next was <coughs> um, 
measuring, again, they have measures of uh, contraction time for those uh, healthy individuals. And then they, uh, using those cadavers, taking biotic samples, they measure the muscle composition. So they manage to uh, detect percentage of uh, fi uh, sorry, slow twitch fibers and uh, medium and fast twitch fibers. So the assumption again was that comparing, <laughs> obviously it's not, not same subjects, so one is a live subject and the other one are dead, you know, so different subjects, even though they, are, they, they said that they were matched for, for physical characteristics and age. Um, again, soleus is a muscle with a prevalence of slow twitch fibers. Uh, you see contraction time quite, quite high. And then if you look at, for instance, two other muscles which, with a prevalence of uh, uh, fast twitch fibers, you see contraction time is, is much slower. Fine, again, uh, you could argue, you know, they're not the same people, though. Uh, you, you're looking at dead people and alive and healthy subjects. Okay, uh, well, moving on. So a third study was published uh, much more recently, so in 2011, as you can see there. Um, now, from a um, research design point of view, this is probably the best study out there on tensile myography. I would say... I would say this is the best study on tensile myography that's been published so far. Uh, not by chance has been published in Medicine, Science, Sports and Exercise, which is a, a very good uh, journal. So what they did this time was, you know, I'd say robust research design. So 27 subjects recruited, uh, measured uh, vastus lateralis, so we, this time, within the same subjects, they, they did T and tension myography, and they took a sample using biopsy. They took a sample of their muscle. So you, 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 you can tell now that the design is quite robust. So the same people measure a sample of the muscle and measure TMG. So it's not two different groups and making assumptions. So um, <clears throat> that's, again, a displacement time curve that you've seen before, and that's an example of um, <coughs> uh, a subject with a, uh, a low content of MHC1, so uh, myosin heavy chain 1, uh, prevalent in uh, slow twitch fibers, and that, that's an example of a subject with a, um, a, a higher percentage of uh, slow twitch fiber. When they correlated all the, all the data. So when they correlated contraction time with a percentage of uh, slow twitch fibers, well, you see the correlation is, is, is very high. Uh, so there's a very high uh, level of correlation, point, point 0.9 nearly. Um, and you, you can tell, you know, this is strong now because it's same same subjects. It's, it's not two different groups, okay? And the, I, I'd say the correlation is, is quite compelling there. So, final study that has to do with validity is a study that we published um, in collaboration with the group in Stirling University in the UK. Um, <clears throat> so, we looked at a number of subjects, uh, 19 young subjects. So, the muscle we examined was a biceps brachii. Uh, what we did was... Um, Measuring both muscles, okay, both biceps brachii, um, <clears throat> with one of them being the control arm and the other one being the, if you like, the intervention arm. Um, in the intervention arm, what we did was uh, inducing uh, like a, a fatigue exercise. So this stands for uh, <clears throat> exercise-induced muscle damage. So we used an eccentric exercise to create muscle damage in the, in, in the muscle. We only did with one or two arms, so the other one, again, acted as, as, as a control. Um, so what happened to displacement? Again, one, one of the parameters has been um, mentioned before. Well, you see the uh, control arm there. Well, nothing changes. So um, that, let, let, let me explain this a little bit better. So that's the measurement at baseline. Uh, no real difference between the two arms. And then the uh, exercise 
uh, was delivered, the eccentric exercise was delivered, and then we measured again after one, two, three, four, five, six days to see uh, you know, the level of damage for, for how long it lasted. Well, you can see there's pretty much no difference in the control arm, whereas there is a, a drop in uh, muscle displacement for the exercise arm. Now, a reduction in displacement means an increase in muscle stiffness, as was mentioned before. You know, so if the muscle displaces a little, a little bit less, it means that uh, is is stiffer, okay? So that's what we... Um, obtained, which is fine and, if you like, um, expected. But then when we measured, <coughs> when we measured torque and uh, rate of torque development, um, you know, between two arms, well, interestingly, uh, you see that the shape of the curve is very similar to the, to the displacement curve. So there's a drop in the exercise arm. Uh, and after six days, there's still no, no full recovery, so the damage was significant. And l look at the torque. It's, it's a very similar situation, similar, similar for the rate of torque development. So quite interesting. And if you look at the contraction time, well, the graph is sort of reversed, but the meaning is very similar. Uh, so uh, no change in the control arm. There is an increase in contraction time, which means the muscle was slower um, you know, after the exercise-induced muscle damage, and it lasted for, well, we measured up to six days and still was not, not fully recovered. Okay, so to, to summarize the results from the validity studies, uh, by the way, there's more out there. I, I, I decided to summarize you know, the most important studies, I would say. Um, so to summarize the results, uh, contraction time is directly correlated to percentage of type 1 muscle fibers and MHC1, uh, discriminates between sprinters and sed sedentary participants. Um, also, <coughs> a fatigue-induced reduction in displacement is matched by a reduction in torque and development and rate of sorry, in torque development and rate of torque development, as we saw in the last two graphs. Um, and also we saw that the, those two parameters, contraction time and displacement, are altered as a result of the uh, exercise-induced muscle damage. Okay, so the second part is about reliability. Again, to recall the concept, uh, reliability is actually very important, something we, we should... Uh, keep in mind every time we do, you, you, most of you are, are sport and exercise um, students, I guess. Um, so whenever we measure something, whenever we, we, you know, we do a test, we should really have in mind the level of real reliability of the uh, procedure we are using or the test we are using or the device we are using. So it is important to ascertain reliability of the tensiomyography as well. Uh, just to give a definition is the level of consistency between measures, uh, which could be, well, as, as you see in, 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 the, in the next slide, well, could be between measures taken within one session, uh, in that case it's intra-session reliability, could be between measures uh, taken between sessions, so in that case we have inter-session reliability, or um, the, measure, the measures could be taken, um, you know, like weeks apart, potentially. So in that case, it's kind of a long-term reliability or, or, or long-term stability, as we called it there. Okay, um, so there are three studies that have been carried out to, 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 to assess reliability in tensiomyography. Um, so the first one uh, published in 2008. So um, <coughs> this study actually measures the, well, assesses the uh, intra-session reliability of tensiomyography, which means if I'm taking a number of measures over, you know, within the same session, uh, what's the level of repeatability? Or in other words, wh what's the error? There is, always, there is always, as you know, there's always an element of error. There's no device, no matter what uh, manufacturers tell you, there's no device that is perfect and is 
is unaffected by error. The error is always there. It's our responsibility to minimize that error. Uh, so intra-session reliability, so they had 13 subjects there, and they took 30 measurements, uh, 10 seconds in between. The muscle was the biceps, biceps brachii. Um, there are a couple, a couple of um, graphs there. So again, that's displacement. And you see the 30 measures there. These are different, you know, each, each line is a, is a different subject. You, ideally, you won't see it like a straight line, okay? If the, if the device was perfect, you would see a straight line, so there's no fluctuation between measurements. Well, it's pretty good. A little bit, a little bit less the contraction time. Uh, there is some variability. Now, when, when they presented the, um, the results in the table, so I want to draw your attention onto the ICC, uh, uh, intra-class correlation coefficient, which is, um, you know, it's very good to all right, I would say. Uh, you see the re relaxation time is, is actually the least reliable. The other thing I, I, I want to say is that uh, intra-class correlation coefficient is fine. They should have presented, they haven't. They should have presented uh, at the minimum coefficient of variation, which you will find in the next study. So uh, correlation, and in other words, reliability is, is you know, very good for you know, that, that displacement, and then it, it drops a little bit to a minimum for the relaxation time. Now, the next study published in 2012, uh, this, this one looks at, at between session reliability. So what if I measure uh, someone today, and then I measure them again tomorrow or in a week time? Uh, do I get the same result? Uh, Keep in mind that that person, that subject, those subjects, they don't do anything you know, in the meantime. So they, they don't alter the, the measure. Um, so that, that's what, what they've done. Ten subjects measure three uh, times, so taken over three consecutive days. Uh, this time we have um, muscles from the lower limb. Very busy table, uh, just want to draw your attention on the coefficient of variation this time they do it, they, they present it. Um, now, coefficient, coefficient of variation, as you know, is, the, is a percentage measure, is, if you like, is, can be interpreted as the percentage error. It's standard deviation divided by mean. Um, as a guide, you want to keep that CV uh, below 10%, potentially around 5%. So you see that uh, for some, some, some of the muscles, some, some of the parameters, is, is, you know, it's pretty good. It's quite, quite low. Uh, pretty good. Pretty good. Again, uh, I, I, I just want to mention that, uh, once again, the relax, relaxation time is the one with the, the lowest, sorry, the highest coefficient of variation. In other words, the lowest level of reliability. OK, finally. Uh, sorry, uh, the intra-class correlation coefficient are there, again, qu quite high. Um, not perfect, but quite high. Um, finally, this is a study that we carried out, again, with the group in Sterling University. Uh, this was published in 2013. So, <coughs> so we looked at this time at the long-term stability. Uh, so instead of, instead of measuring, you know, today, tomorrow, and, and the next day, so we measured four weeks apart. Now, the reason for doing that is because, um, well, you know, you know perfectly that, you know, um, uh, training studies where, where you measure, say, today, and then you do a training intervention of several weeks, over a number of weeks, and then you measure again. So you want to, you want to see um, what's the level of stability when, when, when a long time goes by, you know, after, after a number of weeks. Um, so what's the level of repeatability of those parameters? Well, this is what we did. And we did under different muscle conditions, which I'll, I'll show you in a second. So uh, 21 subjects. We looked at only one muscle, gastrocnemius medialis. So this was the research design. Um, <clears throat> so we took, an, uh, as you can see, four, four TMG measurements uh, before warm-up after warm-up, 
uh, which also means before an NVC and then after an NVC and then we did a fatigue intervention and then we measured TMG again. Um, and then we repeated this design after Now, to summarize,